I wrote this article, I guess it was about a little over a year ago, um, about ghostwriting. I shared 20 things that people might not know about it or might be surprised about it. And as we go through, I may add some details that I didn't include in the article. You might, you might not like this article if you still believe every successful author writes his or her own books. Uh, most of you know better. Some of you may even know people who ghostwrite. You may know people who have used ghostwriters, but you may or may not be aware of who they are. The estimates on how many books are ghostwritten range widely, but if you care enough to look it up, you'll probably have trouble finding an exact number anywhere. In the past, I've seen percentages in the single digits or the teens for fiction. I was dubious of those numbers just based on my own experiences as a ghostwriter. In some recent articles and podcasts from NPR on celebrity books, there was a running estimate that 60% of nonfiction books of all types were ghostwritten. I find that number to be more likely for more than just nonfiction, although I have no way of proving its validity other than, other than what I have seen anecdotally as a ghostwriter. Those numbers don't even include articles or nonfiction and, and other non-book, non-literary ghostwritten content. I became a full-time writer in 2013 and started ghostwriting a year or two after that. I've ghostwritten a wide range of genres and subgenres, including many I would never have considered publishing in my own in on my own. I've ghostwritten for names you have heard of, although you'll just have to take my word for it or simply dismiss me as a liar because I won't offer any proof. Ghostwriting helped pay my rent, my bills, and my writing expenses for a number of years. Even though I'm ghostwriting less and more selectively these days, it still pays my medical expenses, which I was talking about earlier. You may be considering ghostwriting as a supplement for your income or as a path for making a living as a writer. It could potentially work for you. You might just be reading this article out of morbid curiosity, and that's fine too. There are a number of realities about ghostwriting you may be interested in knowing before you consider it for yourself. All right, number one is the Wild West. There are no regulations and no one is policing these streets. What you are paid, what type of work you can do, and how you are treated can fall anywhere along a wide spectrum of possibilities. Clients have to trust you to do the work, and you have to trust them to actually pay you. There are people offering as little as $5 for a, writ a written novel, and oddly, there are writers in the world willing to take them up on it. There are websites where freelancers slash ghostwriters can be matched with clients. I don't use them anymore because their fees and cuts of my earnings kept going up and up and up. Freelancer is one, Upwork is another, and you can make a living off of them if you work at it. Elance was a wonderful site to, for ghostwriting, but it no longer exists. I could write a whole article on what I don't like about these sites, but they may still be one of the best options for starting. As a rule of thumb for setting your rate, get all the information before you quote a price. Is there research involved? Does the client know what they want? How many revisions? Does half finished already mean a working draft, a couple chapters, pages of gibberish, or a nonsensical outline or something worse? Are there any red flags that you might ignore at your peril? Then, if you decide it is worth the risk, find a number that is both worth it, worth all your troubles, and that you think they'll say no to, and ask for that amount. You'll be surprised how often they say yes, unless you are desperate for money and then do what you've got to do. All right, number two. It's all reputation-based. This is where the sites could help. Each five-star rating you get allows you to ask for more money from clients willing to pay for good work. Whether you bid on jobs through the sites or begin with people or businesses you know, you start as an untested variable and you sometimes have to take poor paying jobs to build up to something better. Your own writing is your your own writing in your own name can sometimes help, but this is often a different arena. All right, non-disclosure agreements. Uh, speaking of your own writing, uh, it helped me a little bit in that they could look and see that I was semi-successful as an author. Um, but very often, you know, I'd be applying for uh, romance ghostwriting jobs, and I had no romance uh, stories to my name. So a lot of times it was just kind of word of mouth, like those those five-star ratings with romance jobs on the site had other romance um mill houses that were using ghostwriters to come to me and, and use me and stuff and some of them were happy with what I did some of them weren't they're were, they're pretty particular about what they want 
All right, non-disclosure agreements. Who have you worked for is the most common question I get asked and I never answer. Often I'm legally bound not to, but it makes no sense for me to damage my income sources because some dude is curious. Those, argument, those agreements are binding. Even if the person I worked for tells people, that does not release me from the NDA. Sometimes you are, asking, you are asked to sign an NDA before you learn about the job you might be considered for. That usually means you are going to potentially work for someone really famous or you are about to learn something really crazy about the world. As a side note, read NDAs carefully before signing. Do not accept anything that involves a penalty for late work. Often it's the client's fault something is late. Never sign a financial penalty in a contract. Never sign an NDA that includes a non-compete clause. This is sometimes common in corporate contracts, but it makes zero sense for a writer because technically, even if they don't intend, to, intend it that way, it means you are not allowed to ghostwrite for anyone else or possibly even write your own books in your own name. Make them take those out or don't take the job. So again, you got to be really careful with NDAs. They, 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 they write them a certain way for the corporate world and that doesn't work for the ghostwriting world. Even when it's a secret, satisfied clients are your best advertising. It's a strange balance. You need people to know that you do this sort of ghostwriting work, but you need to conceal any identifying details about exactly who you, what you have done. You sign NDAs, but your future clients still often come through previous clients. I've been subcontracted through former clients. I've had former clients somehow refer people to me without giving away the fact that they had used me as a ghostwriter. Not sure how that works, but it does. Uh, networking was a huge part of um, what I did as a ghostwriter, and most of the people I work for now have come through referrals, and that's why I'm able to work off of the ghostwriting or freelancing sites now, um, and then I don't have to give them a cut of anything I make. Uh, number five, it's not yours. This is probably the biggest obstacle for most people considering being a ghostwriter. Every book you ghostwrite, every character you create, every scene you invent, none of it is yours. You can never use them in anything you write ever again. A lot of people can't function under the weight of writing into oblivion like that. Seeing something you wrote on a bestseller list or pra being praised by others without being able to say anything might be too much for you. For me, it told me I was that good and it boosted my confidence. Also, those authors come back to me and I could ask for more money. All right, so the, anytime people ask me about ghostwriting, and they do it a lot um, because a lot of people know I did it, um, people will ask me if they think they should get into it and what I should consider or what they should consider. And uh, this is the biggest obstacle. It's one of the first things I point out to them is that whatever they create, it's not theirs anymore. And a lot of times they can't handle that, that um, they can't handle that in, as part of their ego. Um, what it did for me was that I was aware that um, how good my writing was if someone else's name was on it. Now, again, that can that can really tick you off if like you're struggling to get publishers to take your work, but then they'll they'll hire you to ghostwrite someone else's work. So it's good enough for someone else's name. And then it's especially troubling if you see your work in like a, a real bookstore or on a bestseller list and you're not allowed to say anything about it. Someone else is getting credit. Now, again, like I said, that's how I was able to pay my bills. When, when the books did that well, they came back to me and I definitely asked for more money. It was kind of a fee for getting to be on the bestseller list at, at my expense or whatever. <clears throat> but again, I, don't, I didn't begrudge anyone that did it um, because I wanted it to do well them doing well is the best way for me to keep working <clears throat> now again I didn't um, <coughs> excuse me I'm so sorry I didn't um, I didn't take it personally when uh, my name wasn't on that stuff but I just kept working harder uh, because it told me okay if what I write is good enough that if a name people recognize is on it they like it, then that just means I need to get my name recognized, I need people to read it, and then they're going to like it. And so that kind of pushed me to go harder in my own writing. All right. <clears throat> Number six, you have to write fast, well, and a lot to survive. I was writing 12,000 words a day at one point when my livelihood was mostly ghostwriting, and the vast majority of those words were not mine. 
for my own work. Doing that, I paid my mortgage and my bills, but it was grueling. I can't do that anymore for a wide variety of reasons. I don't have to because I have the luxury of picking the jobs I want at prices that suit me. Still, money gets tight sometimes. Okay. Um, one of the reasons I can't do this is because I do have some mental difficulties from uh, my trans my kidney transplant where some of the meds kind of mess with my head and then some old injuries too kind of have me slowed down. I mask it pretty well and uh, especially here on stream I've just kind of practiced uh, this this process of talking on stream and writing on stream so um, with practice it's gotten easier and people don't notice my mental gaps quite as much um, when I'm when I'm on stream as, as maybe they might have been able to tell earlier um, but I can't I can't keep up that pace anymore I can't do 12,000 words days over and over but I was doing it for ghostwriting because that's what I had to do in order to get the jobs done in order to get paid in order to pay my rent and mortgage on time and all my bills and so forth so um, that's what I that's what I did to survive back then but I'm definitely glad I don't have to keep up those kind of numbers now all right, number seven, you have less time for your own writing, and that's kind of a natural uh, consequence of the one above. If that wasn't clear from the previous point, I'll state it clearly now. No matter how much time you have, or f how much time you have, or fast you can write, you are stealing from yourself to a degree. You've used hours, you've used your mental and creative reserves, and you're expending your energy on someone else before you sat down to keep going for yourself. You might always be starting your own stories tired. And that is true. Another reason you might want to reconsider it if you're thinking about it. Number eight, it doesn't take much to look good by comparison. So again, this is a positive. Well, a positive for you, maybe not a positive for the industry. Most clients' options are terrible. Sometimes that's their fault because of their budget. Most ghostwriters save their best stuff, quote unquote, for themselves, giving their clients only B and sometimes C level work. My secret is that I give my best on everything I ghostwrite, so I look amazing by comparison. The truth is that my that your B-plus work is probably well above the industry average. Uh, I decided even if the concept or story they wanted was crazy, I'd still write the best werebear erotic romance novella they've ever seen. I wish this was a made-up example. So again, they would give me terrible story ideas sometimes, or uh, what they would hand me was a mess, but I would... Uh, find a way to make it the best I could just get myself into it get myself invested and produce just my best a level work there and one reason I was able to do that is I never feared I was going to run out of ideas so um, you know just this past month this is the 31st day and I've literally written 31 stories in the month of May just as a challenge to myself to write a new story every day June I'm going back to four days a week so that'll give me a little bit of time to kind of <laughs> come up with some new story ideas um, but the, my ability to do that 31 days in a row just came from this partly from this ghostwriting where I could just produce one story after another and I never feared I was going to run out of ideas any idea or scene I gave to one of their stories I would just come up with something better for my own and that confidence whether it was warranted or not kind of allowed me to keep doing that and I've, I've only gotten better at it over time um, so uh, Again, it, I looked really good as a ghostwriter to other people because I was giving my A-level work while most ghostwriters were just giving their B and C-level because they saved their A-level for themselves. So that was part of my secret to success. But again, I had to have the confidence that I could produce something better for myself later. Uh, people who pay the least demand the most. Now, whether you're getting into ghostwriting or not, I want you to hear this because this is a truth that extends beyond writing, but if, especially if you're into writing... Um, this is something you need to take into consideration uh, all the time. People who pay the least demand the most. This rule probably applies to all writing and maybe all of life. The, this extrapolates on down to people who want you to work for free and demand everything. So somebody who wants it for free is going to be the most demanding person that you've ever worked with. Bidding high and getting the job is sometimes worth it because... Bidding high and not getting the job is sometimes worth it because people willing to pay high generally just want the work done well and fast. If you deliver, they have no time or energy to hassle you with endless revisions. There are expectations on the high end, but very few, there are exceptions on the high end, so people who pay well but treat you badly, but very few exceptions on the low end. There are I, in ghostwriting. I mean, um, it is 
it is very rare to find someone who pays badly and but treats you well. Uh, that is that is rare. A note on revisions. Some ghostwriters give a limited number of revisions to avoid being caught in an endless cycle of edits from a client. It's a reasonable concern, but I don't limit re re revisions. I just tell the client we're working on it until you are satisfied with it. My logic is that if I offer three revisions, they will use all three revisions. If they if I offer that I'll fix it until it is right, they are more likely to decide it is right with no revisions. Generally, they want to be finished as much as I do. Satisfied clients build my reputation. So cutting them off unsatisfied at two or three edit passes doesn't really serve me in the long run. I, if I think a client is going to be trouble, I need to weed that out on the front end before I take the job and not try to control crazy in the editing phase. By then, it is it is too late already. All right, number 10, college students cheating on their work and companies producing porn pay the fastest. This was probably something you did not anticipate. Um, at the end of school semester, jobs for quote unquote academic writing or quote unquote academic research pop up everywhere. You could end up doing enough work to have, an, have earned all sorts of degrees from universities all over the world before Christmas and summer breaks. They pay fast because they are on, a tight, on tight deadlines. You just have to decide how you feel about that the work morally. If you are in an educational field, there can be repercussions upon discovery too. If you are just a dirty ghostwriter, it's still the Wild West. Porn scripts, yes I said scripts, and online erotica stories put up by porn sites will pay quickly too. They are seldom short on money and have deadlines of their own. So again, those two places pay the quickest. All right. Um, the more famous a person is, the more degrees of separation between you. Once you get into the mid-list and higher, you'll start working with an author's people instead of them directly. Don't bother asking me who I'm talking about. Number 12, corporate clients are either the best or the worst. And I do mean that there's, there's very little in between. There is not much in between. They can switch from best to worst. So I've had clients go from being great to being awful to work with. But when that happens, it happens quickly. Uh, I've never had it go the other way. I've never had a client that was the worst to work with and suddenly they became became a great client. When it's the best, they pay well, they treat you well, and their instructions are clear and they know exactly what they want to say. They just need you to translate it into written form. And some of my corporate clients have been some of the best to work with, much better than, uh, in many cases, the ghostwriting clients where I'm making a fiction novel for them. Although some of them have had me write fiction novels for them too. Number 13, royalty split offers usually mean you are not going to get paid anything. Don't ever take a royalty split on a ghostwriting job. Um, get your money up front. The guy who has who write his novel and offers you half the royalties on the book and points on the movie has no confidence in his ability to make any money. The pay the least, demand the most rule applies here too. People who know how to make money from books don't want to split the royalties. They'll come back to use you again after paying well. All that being said, I had one screenplay and one novel series pay off big for me on a royalty split. Now, if they decided to lie to me, I'd never have known uh, they were making any money. Even with these exceptions, it is still a bad idea, and I don't take royalty deals on ghostwriting anymore. So that's more of a do as I say, not as I did kind of thing. Everyone wants work done at the end of the year, but nobody wants to pay until the new year. Now, I will add an exception here. Um, this past year, I did have a couple clients who paid before Christmas, uh, so that uh, that was nice, uh, but it's rare. Um, this one is brutal. Maybe it's a tax thing, maybe it's, a, it's budgetary, maybe it's poor planning, or maybe no one is paying anyone around Christmas, so it becomes trickle-down misery for everyone. I plan and save for this dry spell every year, but it is still rough. All right, being good at what you do buys you a lot of leverage. I had to stop all my ghostwriting work for over a year when I had a kidney transplant. My own writing picked up in sales, so I didn't have to go back to it. After working with other people, clients started coming back to me and offering me more money. I picked the jobs I wanted and made more money doing less work. That's how you always want it to work. Um, so that was kind of a nice ego boost there when, um, after having to work with other people, they came back and offered me more money. Because, uh, again, I was doing okay to where I didn't really have to do the ghostwriting. 
Um, but eventually the offers got high enough to where um, it was worth it for me to offset my, my medical costs, which are pretty high. Uh, all the work can dry up all of a sudden. This is number 16, and this one's brutal too. You can be the very best at what you do, and you can have work more work than you can handle, paying all your bills on time like a real adult, and then all of a sudden the work stops coming in. Then it doesn't come in again for a while. That can get scary, and then you start taking awful jobs again just to make a little money, and it's inevitable. It always happens. Uh, capturing someone else's voice is an important talent if you are writing as them. Sometimes you're hired because they want the book you can write. Sometimes they want you to write the next book in a series and it has to match the others. With an autobiography, memoir, or consulting book, you have to become the subject. It takes real talent to capture someone else's cadence, their mode of delivery, their quirks, and then elevate it so that it sounds like them but better. Uh, you can just about print money if you can do that well. Now that's kind of helped me with my fiction writing uh, for my on my own too. My ability to hear someone's voice, kind of get an idea of how they talk, and then be able to use that in writing. Uh, for ghost writing, it's invaluable because um, if I'm writing someone else's book as them, I need to sound like them when I write it. So typically the way I do that is I just have them talk to me. So we talk about the first couple chapters. I have them uh, tell me stuff. I have them answer questions. I'm taking notes on what they say, but unbeknownst to them, I'm also listening to how they say it, how they deliver things. When they say something that's important, when they say something well, how do they do it? What's their style? And then I'm able to do that. But the key to it is to really make it sound like them, but better. So you want the way they would say it, but better, but smarter, but more elevated, but more eloquent, but more powerful, but more moving. Um, if you can take someone's voice and deliver a message through their voice in that way, uh, that's what they're looking for. That's why they're paying you to do it instead of doing it themselves. And uh, the clients that have stuck with me feel like I'm talking as them, but making it better. And so it's not Jay Wilburn's voice that's coming through. It's their voice. And uh, it's it sounds the best they've ever been able to say something. Um, so that's how I've gotten clients back. That's how I've held on to the good clients that I like working with. All right, number 18, prepare for disillusionment. And this is huge. Sometimes after signing an NDA and finding out who the author is, I feel sad to discover their work is ghostwritten. I stopped going to certain conventions for a while because I got tired of having to pretend certain big name authors and I didn't know each other. I bit my tongue while certain authors were praised when I knew that, that they had been seeking out ghostwriters. I stopped submitting work to certain publishers because the gatekeepers there hired me to ghostwrite but, then, but didn't want to publish my work in my own name. Uh, the curtain gets drawn back a little, and you don't always like what you see. There are a lot of little emperors with no clothes. Um, so th this is true. Uh, there were a couple conventions that I stopped going to uh, because there were some bigger names there that everybody loved and adored uh, that had I had literally written uh, stories for. And in one case, one of the stories got nominated for an award and all this other stuff. And so, um, you know, I would be talking to these people or talking to their people um, outside of these conventions, but while we were at the conventions, we had to pretend like we were complete strangers, like I was below them and they were somewhere else. Now, again, as long as they're making money and they keep sending that money to me to write something, I didn't much care. But in that environment with, you know, my peers um, looking up at them and looking down on me, uh, it, it bothered me uh, a good bit. So I would just not go to those conventions. I would go to ones where I knew I wasn't going to run into clients. Um, and that's, that's changed a little bit as I've sort of moved away from ghostwriting. I'm doing more corporate stuff, less of writing for people in my own genre. And, um, you know, I, I guess also I've matured a little too. Uh, I, I, just being around them, it doesn't bother me. I know that they're living a certain life. I'm living my own and we don't have to cross in public. They don't owe me anything other than what they paid me, that kind of thing. But it is kind of disillusion, disillusioning. Uh, to discover who certain people that certain people their work is ghostwritten, especially if you enjoyed it. Number nineteen, you have unique opportunities to experiment and expand your toolbox. There are genres I would have never written stories in on my own. Romance is a big one in ghostwriting. While I'd never write a romance in my own name, I learned certain tricks with romance that work well in writing relationships and other genres. Writing in the voices of other real human beings over and over has helped me better create three-dimensional characters. For, for my own books. Um, 
I gain confidence and skills that enhance my writing ability. And lastly, number 20, it is still being paid to write. If you can do this and do it well, you can make a living or supplement your lifestyle with writing, and that is no small thing in the current industry. You simply have to decide if the realities and the challenges are ones you want to face. So again, that is 20 things I shared about a year ago about ghostwriting. And um, again, I, I still do some of it, and especially if someone offers good money and they've been someone good to work with. Um, but I am, I'm very selective with it. So especially when I'm going out with going up with new clients, I'm going to ask for more money and I'm going to demand to get all the details first because there is no end to the number of surprises you can get. When someone tells you uh, the work is half done and you offer them the price you would for half the work and then you get in there and realize it's all garbage or it's not half or it's not even usable and you're really writing a whole book, uh, you've, you've been cheated. Um, and then like, especially if they start talking about what they think is involved, you got to keep asking questions to find out, okay, am I editing this? Am I working with 16 different people? Um, are there people behind me that are going to be, uh, second guessing my work and making me redo it? Am I answering to a committee of people so that every time I do something, there's six people and five of them decide it's okay. And the sixth one feels like they got to, you know, give their two cents. So you're making changes just so it feels like they're involved, you know, stuff like that, that, those, those things come at a premium for me. So the more of that I figure out, the higher my price goes. And I always try to ask for an amount of money I think they're going to say no to because I want, I, I would rather take the risk of them saying no than undercutting. Now, somebody that's really easy to work with, who I've worked with in the past, who um, I know isn't going to jerk me around, who um, knows what they're talking about. So they know what they want. It's not going to be a thing of where they say something, I give it to them, and they're like, no, that's not quite what I mean. I need a little, I need a, I need it wordsmithed a little more or whatever they say that really doesn't mean anything. So you're just having to guess because they don't know what they want. Um, if you're working with someone who knows exactly what they want and they're going to deliver, they don't ask for a lot of revisions. I'll do any revisions they want. But the fact that they generally don't ask for them, I know that when they do ask for revisions, that it is really something they want and I'm not going to be going around forever. Clients like that. Um, I'll, I'll give them a, a, my best rate, I guess, I, I guess you'd say, I, I never discount my work down to where I'm not getting paid what I think I deserve. Um, but in ghost writing and freelance writing, if, if it's a good client and I like working with them and they, number one, if they pay well and pay on time, um, then I'm going to give them my best rate, uh, because I like working with them. I know the money's going to come quick. It's worth it to me to do it for a little less money because, um, I, I know the money's going to come quick and, uh, I know they'll come back to me and it'll be good to work with them again and, and so on and so on. Um, so those are the secrets of ghostwriting, I guess, as far as I can share them. 